Has God been good to you this week? Amen. Yes. Yeah, God has, huh? Yes. Sir. He's been good to you? Yes. yes. Amen. Anybody have a challenging week? We have trials? We're going through some difficult circumstances? Yeah? God been good to you still? Yes, absolutely. Yeah? You know the great thing about seeing God in the midst of trials and difficulties? God's still present, amen? Yes, God's, God's through you. God's with you through it all. You know the Bible says he'll never leave you nor forsake you. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. That's a promise that you can take to the bank. If you be born again, and then Christ be your God, right? He'll never leave you nor forsake you. It might, it does not mean that there's a promise that everything will be perfect. Rosy roads and unicorns. But then he'll be with you. That's what the heart of Moses was, right? In Exodus 33, the heart of Moses was, hey, listen, God promised him. He said, hey, listen, he promised the Hebrew people. He said, listen, I can't even go up with you people. You're stiff necked and rebellious people. You guys aren't malleable in my hands. I can't do nothing with you. All you guys do is complain and murmur. All you guys do is complain about what you don't have. And when I do give you what you know, when I do provide for you, then all you complain about is that you know you got the wrong thing. Right? Because I can't even I can't even do this. Because I'm not gonna go up with you. That's what he told that's what he told Moses. He said, I'm not gonna go just tell that stiff neck people. But you know what God did in his sovereignty? Here's the great thing about God. God said, I'll go ahead and I'll go ahead and remove your enemies. I'll go into the land of Canaan. I'll do everything I promise. I'll remove your enemies. It's like having the promise without having the the, the promise giver, right? It's like, yeah, here's the birthday gift, but you know what? I'm not going to be there. I don't want to be. I don't want to be around you. But here's the birthday gift, right? That's what I kind of get out of Exodus 33. And then the heart of Moses is, no, no, Lord, I want you. I want you. You are the gift, right? the presence, the grace. How will the people in the land know that you're with us? Is because that you're on our lives, and because you're on our lives, and because you're with us. That's it. Listen, if intimacy isn't for you, then Christianity isn't for you. Right? Intimacy with God is the relationship that we have with Christ. To have intimacy. Now listen, you're, you're saying, well, yeah, I struggle. Okay, that's that's different. That's different. You know, if you're in a season where, you're, but but here's the thing. I struggle with it, but you got to keep pressing in. Right. you got to keep pressing in. you got to keep calling out. But if intimacy is not for you, if you'd rather be religious, and just kind of check mark the boxes and complete all the rules, then well, have fun with that, right? But having a relationship with Christ is something altogether different. Yeah. It is beautiful. Amen? Amen. Amen. God's doing a quick work inside of his people. Boy, I tell you, he is awesome. He is every single yeah, day. Yeah, he is. Mm-hmm. Quick work. Yeah. Amen. Uh, let's uh, transition real quick. Um, here, let's stand. If you can uh, get ready to take this morning's offering, please. Uh, Brian, if you can come, are you able to? How's, how's the old? Yeah? Still kicking. You okay? It's still attached? Yeah. <laughs> you know it's there by the paint? Yeah. <laughs> That's what I say about my back sometimes. <laughs> I know I still have a back because it hurts. <laughs> can you pray, Sam? Heavenly Father. There's no other place I would rather be than being here with you. Feeling your presence, Lord. Praise and turn. Your faithfulness. Lord, we pray that uh, you bless today's tithe and offering. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Uh, the offerings and tithes, you can, you can bring them to the front of the church. If you did not come prepared to bring an offering today and you want to give, uh, go ahead and use your cellular phone. You can text 84321. You can text an amount, and it'll shoot back a link that gives you the opportunity to give. Um, also, you can go to harvestcopper.org, and you can do it that way as well. Uh, thank you very much for your generosity. We appreciate everything that you guys give to the ministry that allows us to be able to come together um, and continue to preach God's word. Um, and build community, amen? His community, his kingdom, yeah. amen? All right, I'll just say amen on my own. Amen. amen. <laughs> Real quick, a couple of uh, quick announcements um, before I forget. Um, 
my oversight pastor, my pastor, will be here next Sunday, uh, Pastor Mitch. So if you have, if you're here, it looks like we got a light, lighter crowd than normal today. Um, so uh, um, I don't know if everybody's trying to get a last minute summer thing in or something like that. It's like this is the last, you know, 100 degree temperature weekend, I hope. <laughs> Jesus' hope. name. Yeah, but, but I think we're transitioning to some cooler weather at the end of the week, and so hopefully it stays like that, like smack it on the back right now. <laughs> but they said that when you make a face and you like, like never mind. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so uh, Pastor Mitch will be here next week. Um, he is a phenomenal man of God, a phenomenal preacher. My, my pastor, he's our overseer. Um, he uh, is someone that I kind of uh, really look up to, and he's mentoring me through uh, being a pastor and all those types of things. He is a, a great uh, man of God, so please, um, if you can, be here. If you see somebody that's not here, I don't have to be the one to always reach out to everybody and say, hey, you need to get back into church. Why don't you guys go ahead and reach out to somebody that you know and tell them to get into church as well. Um, additionally, uh, food and fellowship is next week. So uh, there's, a, there's a few new faces that haven't been here for a food and fellowship, I don't think. Uh, next Sunday is our food and fellowship Sunday. We do it on the second Sunday of every month, right? Um, we just kind of uh, do our normal Sunday service like this, and then we break bread together and eat out in the fellowship hall and everything like that. Um, so uh, now that's only as good as everyone makes it. So if you bring food and, and you are there, then it's great food and fellowship. If you don't bring food and no one's there, then the food and the fellowship is kind of like in the, you know. So it, it, it's, it's really contingent upon us participating and being a part of that. So we'd love to have you. If you're here, bring something to share. Uh, we just bring something and go in there. I didn't really think of a theme, so we're just going to go with whatever you want this next week. Uh, whether it be, yes, Abby. I put up. Oh, she has Your favorite theme. easy dish. Easy dish. There you go. So Patty, so Patty already has a theme, and so we'll go with that. That's perfect. Um, your favorite easy dish. So if it takes you longer than thirty minutes, then don't do it. <laughs> How about that? Is yeah. that, that? Um, that easy dish. Ingredients. Yeah, yeah. So easy dish, food and fellowship. We'd love to sit down and chat with you. Uh, Pastor Mitch will be here. Um, I know that there's some men in here. There's not everybody's here, but we're getting out of here shortly after that, too. We're going to go into our men's retreat. Uh, looking forward to that. There's eight of us that are going to be heading out. Um, you know, after we eat uh, food and fellowship, we're going up over the pass, um, over to uh, a cabin up in the, the woods. So we're looking forward to that. We'll be gone Sunday night through Wednesday morning. We should be back. Uh, that's next weekend. So looking forward to that, spending some time with these guys doing a, a men's thing. All right, let's get into the word. Um, we got just enough time, I think two hours, three hours, I'll cover it, so I think we'll be okay. <laughs> Margaret got it. She's doing one a week. <laughs> Barbara, you're on the discernment team. <laughs> uh, the Great Divide. All right, we're going to preach about the Great Divide. I feel like the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me this week. He uh, said that He is dividing things. You know, in the church, we cry out for unity, and yes, we do want unity in this place. But at the end of the day, you know, we preach God's word in this place, and if people are like, hey, I'm not. Anyways, you know what I mean? It's like we preach God's word in this place, and his word automatically will bring a division sometimes, right? So there is a great divide that occurs. We'll get into this, and we'll explain it a lot more. When God divides, it's good, not when man divides. When, when people do it, we do it wrong, right? We usually do it out of our own. Jealousies, contentions, our own wills, our own desires. When people divide, it's usually out of their own desires. But when God divides, it is always good. Want to know why? Because God is just. Yep. Perfect in all his ways. So when God divides, he does it perfectly. And you actually see in his word, every, uh, oftentimes he'll, he'll, he'll divide things. It is getting more and more difficult in our present world, if you haven't noticed, to remain neutral about anything. It's getting more and more different, yeah. difficult to remain neutral about anything. Mm -hmm. To be, um, you know, people are being forced to make a decision. I almost kind of saw in my spirit as I was kind of praying about this message, I almost saw like this Y in a road. 
and like people were being forced to it, and they were being forced to either choose the narrow path that leads to life or the broad road that leads to destruction. You know, there's, it's like there's a why that's here. And you know what the, uh, uh, the, the factor is, the determining factor, other than obviously God, right? The determining factor is time. Like each day we are getting closer to the Lord's return, that's right. right? And so time is ticking. And it is, it is going forward. There is not going to be a stoppage of time. Say the Lord wants to freeze the moon and turn it back like he did with Joshua, right? Like there is, God is going forward. The time is going forward. And each day that we move forward, we are closer to the Lord's return than we were the day before. Make no mistake about that. Like I can make that prediction confidently. I can't tell you when he'll come. I can't tell you the date, and if I give you a date, please call me a heretic and walk out of this church, right? Like, that is, that, that is not, you're not going to get a date, right? No man knows the day or the hour. But we definitely can tell through Scripture, through the Word, that He has shown His people around the time that He will come, and people are being put into a time of decision to make a decision. And through that, having to make a decision, there is a great divide that is occurring. There's a great divide that is occurring. And believe this, the Lord is causing the divide. We would, we would normally we shrink back like, oh, no, the God wouldn't do that. Do you know that your Savior is coming back? The next time you see him will be in, 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 in robes stained in blood. <laughs> he's a warrior king. When he comes back, he's going to come back with a sword right in his hand. And he's coming back as a lion, not as a lamb. Right? When he comes back, he's coming back with vengeance and judgment. Right? That's the Lord that we serve. And we like to talk about, oh, no, 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 we serve this little Jesus that we kind of Mickey Mouse up that we're kind of comfortable getting close to, but we can't, like, we can't allow him to con- confront us. Like, that's what his word does is confront us. If his word's not confronting your flesh, there might be a problem, like big red alarms. Right? Like, they should be going off. Because that's what it does. Okay. No, you don't believe me. You don't believe me. I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you. Let's go to the first scripture. I'm going to put my glasses on because i got to see that. I want to show you three great divides. I'm going to show you um, the individual. I'm going to show you within the family. And I'm going to show it within the church. I'm going to show you in the, in the, in the individual in the family, and in the church. I am not speaking division of this church. As a matter of fact, if you're relatively new here, everybody that's joined this church since it's been um, since it's been harvest in the last two years, anybody that's joined it, anybody that was here before, you, you probably never heard me say this, but if you've been here since then, you've heard me say a, a, a key phrase. Pray about it and see if the Lord wants you here. Yeah. I am not recruiting people. I'm not, I, I'm not asking people, I'm not begging people to stay. This is, I'm not like telling you, you've got to stay. I am, I am praying and saying, hey, listen, pray and see if this is a ministry for you. Two reasons, right? One, there's the culture. I don't mean, there's a lot of ministries that can accomplish things a lot of different ways, and they do things differently than us culturally, but they're doctrinally sound, and, 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 and that's okay. Like, this might not be the church. That might not be the music for you or whatever. But guess what? We're not worshiping you anyways. We're worshiping the Lord. So we can't sit there and say, well, well uh, worship was good today or worship was bad today, right? right. Like, we're literally not worshiping yeah. you. You understand that, right? Yeah. Right. But the other thing is, too, is that we're going to preach God's word. And God's word is going, I'll just tell you what it does for me. You can tell, you can tell yourself if it does this for you. It offends my flesh sometimes. It does. It confronts my will sometimes. It confronts my emotions at times. It confronts my decisions at times. And when it does, I have to make a decision. Do I submit to God or do I appease my flesh? Do I submit to God or do I appease my emotions? Right? And I'm not saying I get it perfect every time. I have failed more times than not. Right? But God is merciful, and I've had my heart set on obedience yeah. that, yay, thank you, Lord, for your mercy when I've missed it before. And guess what? I'm not going to keep going around the mountain. I want to progress in you, 
Right? So the next time, hopefully, I get it. Amen. Yep. Right? The next time, I hopefully, I progress. The next time, I hopefully, I say, okay, Lord, yes, I see it now. You were, you were checking me. You were convicting me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to obey you and not myself, right. not my flesh, not my desires. <laughs> right? And so for the people, I would say that that's a different thing than corporate. <clears throat> that's the spirit of the Lord and his word. That's the spirit of the Lord and his word. So if culturally, they're like, hey, yeah, I like the people. I like the community. The music's good. The spirit is here. My aunt used to call me, and she used to call me at night, right late at night when she was inebriated. Right? Rusty, I can't find a church. That's what all of my aunts call me. Rusty, I can't find a church. I can't find a church. Go to one where the presence of God is, and they're preaching God's word, and they're lifting up Jesus on high. If they're lifting up Jesus and the spirit of God is bearing witness with it, yeah, you found your church. Yeah. But no, she was so concerned about keeping the Sabbath. Like that was more important to her than, than God's presence in his word. It was like, I gotta make sure they have the Sabbath on Saturday. That was like that was like super important. It's like, are you kidding me? Whatever, go check it in the box. <laughs> go do whatever you gotta do to, to make your to make your conscience feel better. Right? Like, okay, I'll check another box. Uh, uh, like, another box. Like, anyways, I can't even. I can't even. I'm not, I didn't even mean to go down that road, so I'm not going to keep talking about it. So, individual. I want to talk about Hebrews chapter 4 when we talk about division. Okay? We talk about division. We're going to use that word. Let us therefore be diligent to enter the rest. Now, in the context here, he's talking about the rest that we can enter in Christ, that we should. Uh, you know, through trust in Christ. Actually, perfect Sabbath scripture. I didn't even kind of put the two together. But all before this, this is all about the seventh day and God entered his rest and that we should enter the rest now. And it really ha is synonymous with trusting in Christ for our righteousness. You know, not trusting in ourselves, but trusting in him. And when we do, we actually rest. There's a peace that comes upon us when we're not burdened with having to justify ourselves anymore. Yeah. He is our justice. Right? Like that is that is that that gives me rest. Right? So contextually up to this point, that's what it's been talking about. Go read it yourself. And then he says this in verse eleven, let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. For the word of God, the word of God, okay, is living and powerful. What? This this word that we read is actually alive. Okay? It's living and and it's both powerful. It's, it's not like dead. It's not a dead word. It's not an archaic book that has no relevance in society anymore. It actually was created for humanity. The only thing that's changed in our world from apart from the time when the world was beginning and God was breathing on his word and making his word, the only thing that's changed is the window dressing. What do you mean by the window dressing? Technology, humanity, our inventions, those types of things, the things that have progressed forward, you know, all those types of things, cell phones, all that stuff, right? Strip you down, you're the, you're the same as Adam and Eve were when they were created from the dust of the earth. Yep. We are no different. Yeah. Open your chest, and the heart is still the same as it was in Adam and Eve's chest. Yeah. You're no different than them. We are no different than that. Humanity is still humanity. Creation yeah. is God's creation. Still. That's right. We are no different. Right? And so God's word is still living and it's still powerful. Right. Can I get an amen? Amen. And sharper. And, it's, and, and here's about the word also. And it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit. Division of soul and spirit. And division of joints and marrow. I know it doesn't say division again, but you know it's a continuation. It's meaning that, right? That there's a cutting going on. Division of joints and marrow. And here it is. It also divides between the thoughts and the intents of your heart. God's word does that. It actually, I call it getting to the center of you. And reading you. Right? And going into the middle of you. Right? It divides, right? Soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and is a discerner of thoughts and the intents of your own heart. 
What does it do? So soul and spirit are different than each other. That's helping you that. That your soul and your spirit are actually different. What did Jesus say to some guy? One time he said this to many people, but one occasion, one account, Jesus said to a man, he said, follow me. He would say that oftentimes. He said to Peter and Andrew, right, who were brothers, they're fishing. He said, follow me, and they dropped their nets and they came. You know what one person said to him? I can't remember if the guy had a name or not off the top of my head. But he said to one person, he said, follow me. And you know what the man said to him? He said, he said, but first let me go bury my father. You know what Jesus said to him? I mean, if you kind of look at it and you go back and you're like, yeah, I can't believe he said that. How offensive. You know what Jesus said to him? He said, why don't you let the dead bury the dead? I just, and now, now I'm kind of putting my own on it. He says, I told you to follow me. <laughs> That's basically what he was saying. I told you to follow me. Do you know who I am? Let the dead bury the dead. Let them take care of themselves. What he was saying is let the spiritually dead deal with the, with the, with the physically dead. Let them deal with that. I've asked you to come with me. Now, that was a certain, certain account and a certain thing for a certain reason. But what he's saying is that the spirit is different than the soul. Right? Oh. The spirit is different than the soul. Right? Just like our flesh. This is what makes us in the, uh, in the likeness and the image of God. You have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You also have our flesh, our soul, and our spirit. We're triune, just like God. We're triune. And before we were born again, if we be born again, right, our spirit was dead. The Bible says that it was sin and trespasses and dead. Right? Due to sin. And our soul was alive. And what happened before I became born again is my flesh experienced everything that the world has. And what it did is it sickened my soul. Because I would go wherever the flesh wanted to go. Nike just do it, right? I was just like, whatever, whatever the, wherever the wind blows, I would just go. Right? Whatever they put in front of me, I did. Whatever party was going on, I would just do it. Whatever movie was there, I would just watch it. Right? And everything I'm doing, I'm ingesting. Whatever music they're playing, I'm listening to it. Right? It's all going through all of, the, uh, all of the orifices of my life, and it's doing something to my soul. And because I had no Holy Spirit in me, it made my soul sick. Right? Yeah. And then Christ came. Oh. Regeneration. Born again. Praise the Lord. And the Spirit came. Amen? And the Spirit came. And what it did is it put the soul in the middle of the flesh and the Spirit, and it says, now we're going to have a tug of war. Now you're going to have to learn to obey the Spirit, or the flesh. And as you obey the spirit, the soul gets transformed. I didn't even plan on doing all this. The soul gets transformed. That's what's going on. Right? You're saved at the moment of confession of Christ. You're saved from the penalty of sin. But you need to be saved. We need to be saved from the pleasure and the power of sin as well. Yeah. Right? And so the more we obey the spirit, right, it's, pull, it's like tug of war. It's pulling that soul into the spirit and it's sanctifying it. And it's changing it and it's transforming it. And it's saying, listen... I'm going to make you brand new. The soul was pure at its birth. But what happened is, is through life's experiences, disappointments, yeah. and all the things that we go through, right? the soul gets sick. The soul gets sick. This is what we, when we're sanctified, the soul is getting cleansed. Yeah. Yeah. It's getting yeah. purified. And you can take the man out of Egypt, but you still got to take the Egypt out of the man, right? And you're doing things to it. God's doing things to it. His word is doing things to it. And the spirit's doing it. Every time we say, yes, Lord, not me, but you. And we actually follow through with it just a little bit more. It doesn't have a grip on you like it used to. Right? And it's doing things to you. And what happens is you're crucified over here. Right? You're learning what it means to crucify the flesh so it has less power. And the spirit is giving its way more. Yeah, we're talking about like some deep spiritual things going on, right? I don't know if you're new here, sorry. I mean, I don't apologize, but you know what I mean? Like, you'll get it. Anyways, <laughs> and it's like it's going on, right? And you're being, and, and, it's, and, and, and the Spirit is pulling the soul in and it's being sanctified, Amen. purified, right? right? Yeah. My soul was sick, and I still see things that it needs, right? Still needs healing, yeah. right? Jesus said this. Well, Jesus said some God. very peculiar things at times, right? He's like, listen. The righteous, they have no need for a physician. They have no need for it. But I am the one, I came for the sinners to save them. I am the only spiritual doctor on the planet that can work on the human soul that I was just talking about. Right? I'll cleanse that soul, voice. Give it to me. Just obey my spirit. 
When his Holy Spirit comes in and regenerates your spirit and it attaches to your spirit, it gives you the power and the strength to overcome. Right. But who will you obey? The flesh or the spirit? Right? And as you obey the spirit, right, it's sanctifying you. Yeah. Man, I did not mean to do that. Uh -uh. <laughs> but we see a division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, simply flesh, and as a discerner of thoughts and the intents of the heart. Yeah, it can read your motive for things, <laughs> right? Why you do what you do, mm -hmm. right? You might have did a good deed, but you did it for your own purposes, oh. right? You did it to gain an advantage. Mm -hmm. You did it to do this. You did it to do that. That's God's word, right? I'm not trying to condemn anybody. I'm trying to say God's word does that. It reads us so that we would be more sanctified, yep. yeah. that we would have proper wills and motives, Yep. Right? And we would say, hey, now we're quicker than we're awakened to these things. And yeah, God, I want more of that. I want more of that. Like I saw how you worked inside of me and you got me delivered out of that. Right? I seen how I was always gossiping around with the ladies around, right? And I said, listen, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm not going to try and gain an advantage with pastor. Or I'm not going to try and gain an advantage with so-and-so. I'm not trying to do that anymore. So I'm going to quit gossiping because gossiping division causes problems in a church. Come on. Right? Yes. I'm not mad at you. I love you. Like, I'm getting ahead of things, right? <laughs> I don't know that it's happening. I'm just saying. <laughs> Maybe the Holy Spirit knows it's happening. I don't know. <laughs> Believe this, the Holy Spirit knows that it's happening. <clears throat> but I like this. Look at this. God's word is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Sounds like two edges dividing two things. Jesus is the word. That means Jesus is the sword. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Yeah. And the word became flesh. So Jesus was the word before he was ever the man. Yep. He was the word before he was ever the man. When we read the word, we're reading Jesus. And when we read Jesus, Jesus is reading us. Jesus saying, yeah, repent. He said that. From that point forward, he began to preach the kingdom and to repent. Right? Amen. I'm going to skip those notes. We're so far into this. I'm going to get into this. I think we got that. There's a division, right, that happens with God's word. Within the family, I want to read that one. Luke 12, 49. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't get snap. Luke 12, 49. I think this just seems so like... <laughs> I'm sorry. It happens sometimes. Um, uh, see? God's word is reading me. Like, what am I doing that for? <laughs> yeah, I feel convicted. Anyway, Luke 12, 49. <laughs> listen, listen to the words of Jesus right here. Listen to the words in red right here. Luke 12. We all know Luke's the gospel, right? And the words in red are the words of Jesus. You know what Jesus said? He said, I came to send fire on earth, on the earth. And how I wish it were already kindled. Oh, man. But I have a baptism to be baptized with and how distressed I am until it's accomplished. He's like, I want that fire burning among my people. I want that fire inside of them. Now listen, the thing about fire is that stop. Because we're like, oh yeah, I want to be on fire for Jesus. You hear that sometimes, right? And that's fine, I get it, right? I think they kind of talk in the context of jealousy. We've got to remember what fire does. Fire burns things. And it don't feel good when you get burnt by it. It also burns away things. It also refines things, right? Fire burns things, right? Chaff. Right? It separated the wheat from the chaff, and they would burn the chaff, right? And it also refines things. What are you talking about, Pastor? Silver and gold. They would heat it up. They would heat up silver and gold, and they would cause the what's called dross to come to the surface, the impurities to come to the surface, and then they would divide it, separate it, right? The fire would divide it, and it would bring it out, and they would, they would separate the pure from the unpure, impure, right? And they would do that type of thing, right? Silver is, is uh, symbolic in scripture of redemption, right? Gold is symbolic of faith. When you're tried in the, like James says, it, be not, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, sorry, my mind is going a different direction. Don't be, 
you know, don't let it catch you off guard that when uh, various trials come upon you, right, when trials come upon you, and it says that you'll be burned with fire. So what it's saying is that there's a trial by fire to separate the dross that your faith would be pure. Right? Mm -hmm. Amen. Praise God for that. Amen. Yeah. Right? Praise God that this fire would come and it would do something inside of us to separate, divide the impure from the, from the pure. Right? Yeah. I don't want the impure things in my life. I don't want the impure view of who God is. I want the, the, I want the unadulterated, unfiltered, pure view of God's character and nature. Right? And if you're coming with me, we're going together, right? Like we're going to go get God's heart and who he is and what his will is for our lives. Right? That we would have that inside of our lives. Right? And that should build up some hope inside of some people. Because my life is boring without him. Like boring. Oh man. Amen. 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 Holiness, righteousness, and oh, I didn't even read the whole scripture. Uh, sorry. Do you suppose that I came to give peace on the earth? Jesus speaking still. I tell you, not at all, but rather division. Oh. Oh. Whoa. And now look in the context of what he's speaking. For from now on, five will be in one house. Sounds like family. Divided. Three against two. Two against three. Father, father will be divided against son, and son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. What it's talking about is it says that there's going to be a belief and an unbeliever in the same house, and they're going to be divided because the believer is going to have God's spirit inside of them, and they're like, I can't compromise, I can't do this, I've got conviction, like, hey, man, praise God Listen, praise God and how blessed you are that your house is unified under your home. God, man, also, listen, you want a new thing to pray for and thank God for? Fall on your knees. I know people inside of this church whose, whose, house, whose house is not, not unified. I know spouses who wish their husbands were inside of this church with them. Praising God with them. They're sitting there going, what is going on with my husband? I don't get it. He's seen me walk this out. I've shared with him Christ. Listen, praise God if your house is not divided. Yeah. Like, man, that is such a blessing. That is such a blessing because there are so many houses across America, across Copperopolis, across California, whatever, across this region where the houses are not and be praying for your brothers and sisters where you see there's division because God can still do something inside of that place. But it puts them at odds and it makes your place a sanctuary in your home, right? You, you, you want to come home. You want it to be a safe place. You want it to be a house of worship. You want it to be uh, filled with God's presence and His grace. But you got people that are just not there yet, right? And it's hard to, and there's contention, and there's this schism between one with another. And you're like, man, God, I'd love peace. You want to know why there's no peace and there's no unity? Because there's not peace in the home with every individual in the home. Yes, right? Yes. <clears throat> Holiness, righteousness, and purity do not align with the kingdom of darkness. Right. When light is shined and exposes darkness, the darkness cannot comprehend it. Have you ever had anybody say to you, I don't know why you do what you do. You don't know how loud my shout is because you don't know what Jesus has done in my life. Amen. You can't comprehend my shout. You can't comprehend my salvation. You can't comprehend because you haven't surrendered and understand that God has set me free from something I couldn't set myself free from. Right? right? I've tasted and seen of his goodness. I've seen how good he's been to me. I've seen what he's done. You can't take my praise away. Amen. Amen? Amen. You can't take it away. Your unbelieving family members can't comprehend your righteous decisions. They can't comprehend why you're not about that anymore. Why you don't speak like that. Why you don't watch that. Why you don't do that. Why you can't do that anymore. Why you, why you turn your head when you're trying to watch a movie and you're like, oh my gosh, there it goes again. They're trying to show some flesh. Like, I don't want to be about that. I don't want to see that. Right? right. They can't mm -hmm. comprehend that. They don't know... Oh, sorry, I already said that. It creates a division. The kingdom family, I'm just going to say this. Whoo, boy. 
Oh my gosh. We're reading the word. That's all we're doing, reading the word. The kingdom family takes precedence over the biological family. Yeah. Especially when they're not the, when they're divided. Yeah. Primarily. Right? The kingdom family takes precedence over the biological family. Read this account from Luke 6. I'm challenging people in here. Luke 6, 19 through 21. Account where Jesus' mother and brothers come to him. And they are desiring to talk to him. But he said something so profound. He said, he said, my mother and, and brothers are those who desire to do the will of my father. He goes, this is, this is my mother and my brothers right here. This is my family right here. This is the family that I'm with right here. The ones who were born again who were seeking after God's will. Listen, you want to come into the circle? Feel free. You're welcome. Right? But if you're outside of the circle, sorry. This is why Jesus was saying that whoever loses mother, brother, father, mother, whatever the case may be, for my name's sake or for my kingdom's sake. He said two things. My name's sake is salvation. My kingdom's sake is ministry. When you serve God over serving family, over you know things that are not of God, right? And putting the priority of the kingdom and expanding the kingdom. <laughs> come on, right? I'm telling you, Jesus, words of Jesus. He said, whoever loses them for my name's sake or my kingdom's sake, right? Yeah. Are we willing to do Oh, my gosh. How are you doing? We okay? Mm -hmm. Are we still tracking? Yep. Okay. <laughs> right? Because it's not easy, right? We prioritize the temporal over the eternal. It's easy to do. What's right in front of us? What's easy to cave to? Yeah. What's easy to please? What's easy to keep the peace? What's, what's easy to breathe apathy? What's easy to breathe complacency? Let me just fall in line. Let me just do what they ask me to do. It's okay. I'm just going to do what they want. I'm going to prioritize that. I'm going to prioritize this over prioritizing the kingdom, which Jesus said, not me. This is not my theology. Which Jesus says, whoever loses them for my name's sake or my kingdom's sake. Yes. You're not about it? You're not going to prioritize it? I'm prioritizing it. You want to know why? Here's another thing, too. You have a better chance of winning them by prioritizing the kingdom. Uh -huh. right. yeah. You have a better chance of winning them, as a matter of fact. Because when you prioritize them, what you're telling them is that the kingdom's not important, and so you're breeding apathy in the home. You're not breeding, bre breeding a, a fire, a zealousy for the things of God. If they always see you going, they're either going to miss it or they're going to, they're going to, they're going to, you know the end. Yeah. <laughs> right? I don't know I got to say it. Right? They're going to they're gonna either miss it or they're going to not choose it. They're going to say, no, I want what you have someday. <clears throat> someday they're going to be like, oh my gosh, I get it now. Oh my gosh, you're always prioritizing that. Wow, because that's so powerful. I see the change inside of you. I see what you're doing. I see how you're living. I see what you're choosing over the things that I'd rather do. Amen? Amen. We are prioritizing the wrong thing oftentimes. Within the church, division within the church, 1 Corinthians eleven nineteen 19 says this. The Apostle Paul says, For there must be factions among you. Now, if you look at that word factions, it's a word division. And it says that, that those who are approved may be recognized among you. We usually think of factions and divisions among Christians as nothing but a problem. We always try to create unity in house. But this is why I always say, listen, pray until you belong here. You want to know why? When someone walks out of here and they're like, this ministry is not for me, uh, you know, who knows for what bevy of reasons it could be. Maybe culturally it doesn't fit. But if it's like, you want to know why we kind of remain a small church prior, uh, primarily is because we preach on this stuff right here. And it makes people's flesh uncomfortable. And people can't handle that. But you know what I'm not going to do? I'm not going to compromise the word of God. I'm not going to compromise God's word. I, when I said to God, I said, God, I'm going I'm to do this. I'm going to say, God, as long as I can be, as long as you give me the authority and the power to preach the word, so they can be backed up with you and your presence, and that people will choose and be saved. Listen, I don't care if it's five people, I don't care if it's 500. That's his business. That's his business. But as far as what I do, I'm preaching God's word. Whoever wants to stick, can stick. Whoever doesn't, doesn't. I'm not asking anybody to go. Please, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that that's what Jesus did it. Jesus began to preach. Oh, man. Okay, I'm going to say it. Jesus began to preach, and he began to do signs and wonders, and he began to get a great following. Wouldn't we show up, man? Oh, they're healing up this tech revival. Oh, they're doing this. Oh, my gosh. The Spirit, the spirit of God poured out. But you know what they won't do? They won't preach to you about sin, righteousness, and truth. 
Right? They'll do a miracle show all day long. Praise God. If it's the Spirit of God, praise God. I'm, I, if I'm not there, I'm no man to judge it. But what they don't, what they won't do is they won't be your pastor and they won't carry you through and they won't preach about the things that, that we're hearing today that, that set us free and cause us to move forward. Amen? In Him, in His kingdom, and be everything that God has called us to be. You know what he did in John 6? John 6 is a great story. And he began to do those things, and he had these many, the Bible says, many disciples. Disciples are students or followers. People that began to follow him. He's like, yeah, I see what you're doing. I see the power that you're operating in. We're following you. I've seen the hand of the miracle grow, uh, you know, happen. I've seen you feed 5,000, man. You broke out all of the loaves and the fishes, and it was just so awesome. He did all those things. And then Jesus started to <sighs> wax reality on them. He began to say, listen, you need to start to eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. And anybody who doesn't do that has no partaking of me. Partaking of the, the blood is of righteousness and partaking of the flesh is saying, listen, I surrender my flesh. Listen, it's communion, right? That's, that's what we know is communion, right? That we would have a common union with him. We'll, take, we'll partake of your blood and we'll partake of your flesh. That we'll crucify our flesh just as your flesh was crucified. That we'll, this is why the Bible says in, in Corinthians that many people were taking it for the wrong reasons and they weren't taking it in righteousness and truth with the right heart. But it says that, that, that that's why there's many sick among you. Right? They were really sick among them because they were taking it and they weren't really in the kingdom family. They weren't really walking and living in obedience. But if they're walking and living in obedience, then when you take communion, you're saying, yes, I'm a part of your flesh. Yes. Yes. I'm a yes. part of you. Yeah. Yes. Oh, man. <laughs> so, listen, are we good? Yep. So I'm a part of you. I'm a part of what you're walking. I'm a part of what you're doing. Now you're saying, we're in a union together. What is a union? Right? It's binding. Right? It's one with another. Just like the marriage union. Right? Just like the church union, where we're inside of Christ. They will say, listen, my life is yours. But when you take communion, we're not even doing communion today. When you take communion and you're saying, my will, my desire, my, I'm feeding my flesh, but I'm going to take communion because they were doing it at church and I'm kind of just going to do it with them. Don't do it for that reason. Listen, if you're not in Christ, just don't even take it. No. Don't even take it. If you're not walking in obedience with him, don't fool yourself or anybody else in here. No business doing it. If you're in him and you're like, yeah, Lord, my, my life is yours, take it. Yes. Right? That's what we do because then we're taking it for the right reason. Uh -huh. Amen? But then, oh, no, I'm not finished. So, <laughs> so they're walking with him and he says all these things and it says in John, I don't think, I don't think by coincidence, although I know the numbers and the chapters were given long after Jesus' day, but in John 6, 66, you go read it for yourself. God is sovereign. You know what it says in that moment? After the, uh, You read it about six verses earlier. It says, does this offend you? And then in John 66, 666, he says, from that moment, his disciples walked with him no more. Let me know what 666 is. It's the number of man and his will and his desires and his motives and his schemes and what he wants, not what God wants. 666 is the mark of the beast, yeah. right? That they would choose that. Now, I know. I don't think it's a coincidence. That's just me, okay? I'll tell you when it's me. But I can tell you what the scripture says in that, in that verse. It says, from that moment forward, his disciples, his students, it was too hard. I can't go any further with you, Lord. This is just too much. Jesus didn't say, you know what he didn't do? He didn't say, hey, Shran, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to offend you. Oh, let me lighten that mood up for you and let me say it a little differently. He didn't do that. He did not do that. He didn't say, hey, no, listen, let's, let's, let's create a no strings attached relationship that I can just not confront you and I can just kind of, you can, you can be safe here. And we can just like not convict you at all. He didn't do that. No, he, he kept his word and what he said. And it was challenging. The church wants to see these great signs and miracles, but yet they can't even like say, hey, listen, Lord, here I am. I'm, I'm all yours. Do what you want with me, completely, holy. Break me down so that you can build me back up and make me new. We're sitting here trying to play one foot in the world and one foot in the church. Mm -hmm. Trying to do whatever it is we want to do to build That's our funny. kingdoms. Yeah. Right? This is going a different direction. Okay. So within the church, right? <clears throat> we usually think of 
factions and divisions among Christians is nothing but a problem, but Paul reveals the purpose God has in allowing these factions. God allowing these factions, these divisions within the church. God allows them. That those who are approved may be recognized among you. This is why I think in the scriptures it says that there are some that were of you, but they left. And it doesn't mean that everybody leaves here. I'm not saying that's an indictment, but there, it says that there were some that were among you, and it said if they were of you, they would have stayed. But they're not of you, so they left. We had a big breakdown of the church two years ago, two and a half years ago. A lot of people left. I don't think they were of them. I'm just going to call it right there. They just weren't of them, right? God allows faction so that over time, those who really belong to God would be made evident. We cry for unity, but never at the compromise of the main tenets of his word. That doesn't mean like every doctrine we have to be like right on, but I'm talking about the main tenets of righteousness through Christ, right? Salvation in him alone. Yeah, like that's the reality of everything, right? Like those things need to be like rock solid, right? Um, we cry for those and that's what we unify for, right? People that want to go side their, start their own side ministry or trying to undercut, you know, the pastor and kind of go out on their own thing and just start their own thing. That's like that, that, that. That's not even how the church operates. He didn't say, "Hey, let me write to the Church of Corinth, but also to that little side ministry that's an offshoot of what they got going on over there, and let me do that." Right? Like there was always a, a, an authority and, a, and, a, and an operating of the church of the city that was always done in reverence to the authority that God establishes in that place. Amen. Right? This is something that the church has lost, and I don't do this just because I'm a pastor. I used to do this when I was in the laity. I understood authority in the church, right? And I would preach about these things. People, listen, oftentimes we don't have anything because we don't want to be submissive, but people don't like that word. Submissive to the church and authority. When really it's God's ordained authority that we be submissive to. And when we do so and God has order in his church, it's beautiful to him. It's actually really good. That's the true unity that he's looking for, where he can pour the oil out, the spirit out, inside of the house of God. So that we can be blessed. Right? That we can be blessed. Right. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Couple points and we're almost done. Oh my gosh. Mm-hmm. Okay, you guys good? Mm-hmm. It is better to stand with the Lord than to make peace with your enemy. Okay. It is better to stand with the Lord than to make peace with your enemy. We're talking about division. It is better to stand with the Lord than to make peace with your enemy. Oftentimes I think we try to make peace to appease our current situation rather than making us stand for righteousness sake. I am not talking about, let me clarify, being annoying for the sake of being annoying. You know what I mean? Like we've seen that before, right? Sometimes we see that, you know, that Christian just trying to be annoying for the sake of being annoying, trying to get on everybody's nerve, trying to say this or that or whatever. No, I'm talking about making decisions of the autonomy of your choices, right? And saying, listen, I'm not about that. I'm doing this. I'm going to stand with him, yeah. not with you, the group. Yeah, yeah. I'm, going to be the, I'm going to be the fish that goes upstream while you guys are all going downstream because it's easy. Right? I'm going to go the road that's hard and less traveled and more difficult. Right? And I'm going to choose him over you even if it's more difficult. Right? Amen. Confrontation is a necessary discipline that we need to have inside of our lives. We need to be okay with confrontation. Right? It must be done to rectify, purify, and unify the community. Inside the church, included. Inside the home, included. Yeah. Confrontation is a necessary discipline that we need to practice. Right? We can't let things go because the more we let things go, things begin to erode. <coughs> right? Yeah. Things begin to get worse yeah. the more we let things go. Yep. Right? It's like, yeah. no, sorry, we need to deal with that right now. Like that needs to be dealt with. Right? Zero compromise. Proverbs 27, 5 says this, better is open rebuke than hidden love. Yes. Better is open rebuke than hidden love. Sometimes we're like, oh, we want to just kind of like keep the peace and hide that love instead of saying, hey, listen, brother, we're going to have to talk about something. I, in the last year, have tried to get more better about that in the church. It was not easy for me, right? Like, hey, pull people aside. This is a good conversation. We need to have a conversation. We need to deal with something. We need to talk about this. We need to get this out in the air. That would be better for our marriages. 
That would be better for our relationships and coworkers at work. That would be better for all of our relationships. We have lost the ability through, what is it called? What are they doing nowadays, Tony? Um, political correctness. We have, we have allowed, as a, as a country, we've allowed political correctness to get in, 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 in the way of not addressing things that need to be addressed mm-hmm. and to talk about things That's right. that That's need true. to be talked about. Right? We can't do that. We have to have healthy, good conversation, obviously built on respect. Yes. Mm-hmm. Right? But say, listen, <clears throat> this is what we need to do. And then when it's like in the church, just so you understand, when there's order, right? It's like there will be disagreement, but you will never know submission until there is disagreement. Mm-hmm. Because when there's agreement, it's easy to submit. Right? Oh, yeah, we agree. Right? <clears throat> it's okay to hear both sides. But once there's a decision that needs to be made, true, true submission is tested in disagreement. Right? Yep. Somebody got it. I don't know who that was. <clears throat> Our intentions are made known when we want the benefits God offers but refuse to suffer for God. What do you mean by that? We use Hebrews 13, 12 to illustrate that. Jesus said this, right? We're talking about standing with the Lord rather than making peace with our enemy. Hebrews 13, says, 13, 12 says this, Therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people, right? Set us apart for purpose in him, that sanctify the people by his own blood. He suffered outside the gate. It's kind of interesting that it says outside the gate. Outside there where rejection is, right? Serving God can oftentimes be lonely. It can feel like you're walking on your own. Right? Sometimes, especially if you're in a house on your own. Right? You can be, you're out here outside the gate, feeling the rejection, feeling the shame, feeling the suffering. Right? Therefore, let us go forth to Him, talking about His church. Let us go forth out there with Him. It didn't say for them back there, it said for us right now. Let us choose to go outside the gate with Him, that we might suffer as well. Right? That we might be outside the camp bearing His reproach. Oh, that's not the modern day gospel that tells you he's going to give you a boat, you know, all, all the riches, pay all your bills, yeah. and take care of all your circumstances. I signed up for it. Um, <clears throat> point number two, we should praise God for this division. This kind of division, we actually should praise God. This should be good for us. We see throughout scripture that God divides. How does he divide? He divides light from dark. He divides kingdom-minded from worldly-minded. He divides wheat from uh, chaff. He divides son from the illegitimate. He divides obedient from the disobedient. He divides the righteous from the wicked. He divides truth, true faith from religion. Humble from the proud, free from the slave, leavened from the unleavened, blessed from the cursed, life from death, and goats from sheep. God does these things. He divides these things. And we want to sit here and preach about some fluffy Jesus, you know? Like, I don't get it. I like this stuff. <laughs> Sorry for you guys. <laughs> this is great, right? Like, this is good. The division is good. It's good to cut off the things. It might hurt, but it's good. It's ultimately good. If you want to deal with the gang green, right? If you're in the military, you get gang green out. You get to cut that thing off. It's going to cause problems if you keep it attached to your body. Right? This is like Jesus said, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Get the leaven out of it. Leaven is sin. Get the leaven out of the body, yeah. right? That the, le- that the leaven, that the bread might be pure. Yep. Amen. 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 God likes division. God does division. Not the division like you're not going to do your math work. Yeah. Like that. He's going to do division. Praise Jesus for this. Praise Jesus for this. Amen? Amen. 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 So the question is, is, is there a division among me? Is there a division among me? Because I don't want anybody to walk out of here like questioning things, right? First, I want to deal with the individual. First Peter 4, 1 says this. First Peter 4, 1 says, He who has ceased from sin has suffered in the flesh, right? When we begin to cease from sin, we're going to suffer. When we begin to suffer, we're, ce- we're dividing from sin, right? There should be a division among us individually. That's what we read in Hebrews chapter 4. Right? Cutting away, two-edged sword, right? Soul from spirit, that happens at born again, right? Joints from marrow, 
that is perpetual, ongoing, as we continue to walk with Christ and to look at the thoughts and the emotives of our heart, right, and the intents of our heart, that's ongoing as well. God is going to search you. God is going to always search his word as you read it. It reads you. Yes, it does. And it's doing something inside of you whether you recognize it or not. Yep. If you're reading it prayerfully and born again of the Spirit, it is doing something inside of you. Yes, Praise is. God for that. So yes, individually, if you be born again, yes, there is a division among you. Right? It is always happening inside of you. Amen? Amen. And if it's not, there should be a concern. And it's good, by the way. It's good. Praise Jesus. Amen? There's also a division among family. Matthew 19, 29 says this, And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. Right? Your choices should always be in the kingdom, but that's your choice. Just like your choice for Christ, right? Is to choose him. Yeah. Right? Like there is nobody in this room, in my household, in my family, there is nothing. We have to be the only ones that would stand for Christ if we were the only ones. Yeah. We have to become that. Yeah. If something changes in my family dynamics, we have to say, you guys are crazy. I'm serving God. Amen. Right? If yeah. something changes, we are not going back. I know what that had to offer. Yeah. I am serving the Lord, and you ain't making me change. Yeah. Amen. And Day to day, begin to change the dynamics in your home by change, by making stances for Christ as well. Yep. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> and then in the church, I just put, I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. I mean, not in, in a good way, in God's way. Not in, not in, in, when I say division in the church. When I say that, I, I want to make sure I'm very clear. I hope so in the sense that it's God doing the dividing. It's God doing the divine. Not that divisions would rise up among us and we would have our fleshly ways and we would have our you know, opinions heard and our wills done and everything like that done, right? That we would be a body that would be unified, that we would be a place of substance, compressed substance by the power of God doing what he does inside of us. And he's compacting us, right? And he's, this is like 2 Corinthians chapter 4, I think, right? That he's compacting us and doing something inside of us that is bringing a greater strength of the spirit inside of here by cutting off things that are carnal. And if you go, you go. I love you. Still. Right? But God's dividing and God's choosing what he wants to do. Amen? That's it. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> uh, you can stand with me today. We'll get you out of here. I'm hungry. I gotta feed my flesh. No, <laughs> just so much. Just so much. Just so much. <laughs> hey, I'm not fasting. Okay. I did this morning. Well, no, I have some of that bread out there. Okay. Heavenly Father, God, we just give you praise in the house today. God, you are so faithful and good. You're so awesome and perfect in all your ways, God. We just we welcome the dividing, Lord, both of us personally. If you don't agree with me, that's fine. That's fine. You don't have to agree with me. You can tell them in your own heart. But we welcome the dividing both in us personally with your word and your spirit and what it does. God, that you would accomplish your wills inside of us uh, Lord, on a microcosm level. But God, that Lord, you would also uh, do so, Lord, in our family. God, we invite you. Lord, I pray that you give us the courage, the boldness, the strength. God, the, the, the conviction to make bold stances for you when needed, when needed, right? With wisdom and when needed, God, that you would, Lord, that we would be filled with so much boldness and courage and that we would be so emboldened by your word that says that you did not come to bring peace on the earth, but you came to bring a sword, that you came to bring division. God, I, I, and I feel sorry for every undivided home in this place. It is hard. It is difficult. It can feel all alone. But God, I pray, God, Lord, that you be glorified you be glorified through it all. You be glorified in your children when they're making stances. I pray, God, Lord, that you would show up for them when they are living for you and when they are choosing you above all else. God, just as your word said, Lord, that you would do a great work in that area. God, and I thank you, God, Lord, in every house, Lord, that is unified in this place. God, I pray that we would just fall on our knees 
God, and give thanks to you, God, Lord, for the, the unity that we have with our with our households, Lord, that it is a true sanctuary of God and a place of safety and security in you. God, that the presence of God falls on that place. God, that it would be a place, God, Lord, where we uh, praise and give you uh, honor and glory. God, we thank you for that. God, Lord, that in this church, God, this, should, this is your church, as I have always said, and I believe, Lord, that it is so beautiful and the presence is so powerful and the grace does abound so much more. And God, Lord, there is hearts being drawn in this place. God, I, I, I thank you, Lord. I believe that you protect us. You protect and you keep this church, Lord, by your hand. But God, I pray also, Lord, that you give us the wisdom and the courage and the boldness to continue as we disciple one another and grow with one another. And Lord, uh, Lord, uh, your word, God, Lord, does something inside of our heart that is sharpening us and strengthening us. I pray, God, Lord, that you continue to give us the, the courage to preach your word with boldness and with truth. Preach that truth. So, God, be glorified in our churches, in our family homes, and in our, in our bodies. God, Lord, have your way in us. We give you all the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. His church said, Amen. Amen. Uh, food and fellowship next week. Don't forget, I want to come and eat with you guys and have a good time. Pastor Mitch is here. He is excited to come see our fellowship. Please be here, and if you can, invite somebody. It would be awesome. Uh, he's, a, he's a great man.